So she's inquiring about taking baby aspirin and what's its role in high blood pressure? Well, um, basically, uh, there was a study that looked at what's the role of, of baby aspirin in people that have high blood pressure. And they found that in people whose high blood pressure was then well controlled, baby aspirin prevented deaths. So they say now that if you have high blood pressure plus other health problems and your blood pressure is well controlled, that a baby aspirin will help you cut the risk of, of death. So another so, question. So just to elaborate on that, the reason your blood pressure needs to be controlled on a baby aspirin is one of the problems with uncontrolled high blood pressure is actually bleeding, brain bleeding. So we, need, we, we like to see the pressure under 170 or so before we risk baby aspirin, and we'd like it even lower than that, truthfully. Also, aspirin causes bleeding. So you have to balance the bleeding risk against the cardiovascular risk. So if you're a very low cardiovascular risk otherwise, your bleeding risk might overwhelm your cardiovascular benefit. If you're at high cardiovascular risk, certainly your, your cardiovascular benefit will overwhelm your bleeding risk. So the question is, can high blood pressure medications be taken in the morning or at night? And is there any difference between choosing the time of taking your medication? So some medications are meant to be taken multiple times a day. And the reason is that those blood pressure pills wear off partway through the day. And what they found was that in patients that didn't have 24-hour day coverage of blood pressure pill, that they would have higher risk of having strokes. So each pill is different in the amount of hours that it covers you a day. So if you have, um, because there are also some daily fluctuations of blood pressure. So the standard is usually to take the blood pressure pills in the morning, um, because especially at night your blood pressure is lower. But all of those pills that are, are once a day pills cover 24 hours a day. So if you took them in the morning or lunch or supper or bedtime, it should cover you a full 24 hours regardless. I hope that answered the question. I don't, Doc, do you have anything else to add? Well, just the, the one thing is that be, you can take a pill once a day or twice a day, and most people will remember to take most of the pills. As soon as you start people on three and four time a day pills, you, people, nobody can remember. So um, if you set out your pills at night, if you take your pills at night and set out your morning pills and when you brush your teeth at night, you take your pills and you take your pills in the morning when you brush your teeth, you're not likely to forget. But if you have to remember to take them at work, it, 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 so forget it. So we look actually for once and twice a day pills and try and avoid giving blood pressure medication any more than that in stable outpatients. Right, because what you don't want, you don't want your blood pressure doing this through the day, like you take a pill, it drops, and then you don't, you miss the lunch pill, and then it goes back up, and then you take another one, it drops, so you want smooth blood pressure lowering through the day, generally smooth. So the question is, I have chronic pain and I take Tylenol arthritis and sometimes ibuprofen. Does this affect my blood pressure? Yeah, pain itself can affect, can raise your blood pressure. <gasps> Okay. And, uh, and stress, of course, can, and the stress of dealing with a chronic illness can also raise your blood pressure. And, and anti-inflammatories, arthritis pills can also affect your blood pressure. So all of those factors are probably weighing in, and your blood pressure wouldn't be as high if you didn't have chronic pain with the occasional anti-inflammatory. On the other hand, anti-inflammatories can sometimes be so great for people to keep them with a normal lifestyle that I'll work around them and I'll just say, well, you know what, fine, it's raising your pressure, I have to give you more blood pressure lowering medication, but so be it. So what would you suggest on some kinds of physical activities like strength training or weight lifting, which are associated with possibly elevating blood pressure? What's that role in people with so, high blood pressure? So to, so to lose, to, to drop your blood pressure, weightlifting is not known to help. So it, it actually does not make a difference to your, it doesn't, it doesn't improve your blood pressure. So when we talk about exercise, it's really the walking, the cycling, the swimming. And then I mentioned this new isometric hand grip. So other types of exercise like weightlifting does not improve your blood pressure. 
So you really have to see if your doctor thinks it's healthy for you from a heart perspective to, to do weightlifting exercises, you can, but it will not lower your blood pressure. So another question is, can people with diabetes take diuretics and what would be beneficial to reduce blood pressure and weight loss for people who have diabetes? So, so it's two questions. Twofer. <laughs> Twofer. <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, question about can you take a water pill, and by water pill we mean like a thiazide diuretic. So I don't know if you've heard of thiazide diuretic like um, diazide or some sort of thiazide diuretic or thiazide water pill. That has been shown to really reduce the risk of heart troubles in patients with diabetes and high blood pressure. So that's fine to take. There's another water pill called Lasix or furosemide. I don't know if you've heard of it. That's not quite the same. So that hasn't been shown to reduce heart, heart problems in diabetic patients. But if you're taking it for other reasons like swelling or heart failure, that's fine. Um, the second part to that question was how to lose weight. Right. If you're diabetic. Yeah. So it's really the, the um, same sorts of things. Diabetes, um, sugar control responds very well to exercise. So exercise and following the, the diabetic diet guidelines will dramatically help you lose weight. So you can exercise and you can just simply follow a, a diabetic diet. And, and it's more important for diabetics to lose weight than for non-diabetics to lose weight, obviously. So what's the best way to solve having a low blood pressure but high pulse? And what kind of doctor would you see to help with this problem? Uh, yeah, well, I'd say I wouldn't worry about it unless your low blood pressure actually caused symptoms. So if you're dizzy or you're fainting or you're falling from low blood pressure, then, then it's a problem. Uh, otherwise, it's not a problem to have low blood pressure. High pulse rate depends how high uh, people with pulse rates over 110 on a consistent basis are more susceptible to heart problems. So, you know, that's a bit of a complicated patient who you would see. Uh, I would say any specialist in blood pressure or internist or cardiologist or nephrologist or, or uh, your family doctor would be a good place to start. I, hope, I, I just want to make sure that they weren't talking about pulse pressure. No, it's the low, pul pulse. low okay. Heart okay. pulse rate. Heart rate. Okay. Okay. So um, someone's concerned about having episodic sort of office stress, high blood pressure, and how worried should they be? And the other question they had is, can your blood pressure shoot up at night while you're sleeping? So, so, um, well, we I think we talked about the office, the office pressures. I would worry less about, and if, if your pressures are high in the office and normal at home, I would be reassured. If your pressures are high in the office and high at home, they are the kinds of pressures that can get people into trouble 10 years down the line. Uh, the, and about blood pressure going up at night? Um, if you're not getting 24-hour coverage, that can happen. The usual thing that happens to blood pressure at night is it falls anyway when you go to sleep. And if it doesn't fall, that's not a good thing. And it certainly, if it rises at night, that's not a good thing. You wouldn't know it, but um, over, the, over the course of, of years, the elevated pressures at night would, would, uh, accumulate, would accumulate to increase your, your blood pressure, your risk from blood pressure. And the one person, the, the, the kinds of people that do have pressures that are elevated at night are the sleep apnea pa patients, whose pressures go up in response to not breathing very well. So that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, this person has uh, had a silent stroke and a small infarct and wondered what kind of medications they should be on and what should their blood pressure be? So, <clears throat> so patients that have had a previous stroke in the past, there are studies that show that a combination of a water pill and one of the prills, like there's a particular drug called perindopril. It's one, you don't have to take that particular drug, but it's called an ACE inhibitor as the drug class that that combination really lowers the risk of having more strokes. But the key thing, it's not so much the drug, but it's just making sure you get your blood pressure down to target, and the target is less than 140 over 90. Shouldn't the blood pressure be taken occasionally from both arms? I think once. 
if, if, if your blood pressure is pretty close in both arms it's at, at, at a visit, then you can pretty much assume that it's not going to vary between arms on, on a general basis. Some people do, however, have um, uh, blockages in the arteries to one arm or the other, or their physiology, their arteries take off at a different angle to either side. So the first time I see a patient, I always do a blood pressure in both arms. And then which arm do you think I, f I measure from then on? The higher arm or the lower arm? The higher. the higher arm, because that's the pressure pretty much that the brain is seeing and the heart is seeing. So uh, it's a good question too, but as, uh, so every doctor at the first time they see you and measure your pressure should check both arms. After that, I just generally check the higher arm from the first visit. Why does alcohol affect blood pressure? And I guess it means over that limit that you've outlined in your talk. That's a good question. So um, alcohol does cause, um, uh, it does cause, uh, I'm trying to think of the terms, it causes autonomic uh, problems and basically it causes like a stressor to release stress hormones and that stress hormone causes pressure, it causes you to press down or the blood vessels to press down. So that's how it causes high blood pressure. And then in patients who drink too much alcohol regularly, the, the, and these are now in the class of alcoholics. When they stop drinking, they can get some sort of abnormality in their, their nervous system and can cause um, for patients to have rapid heart rates and, again, high hormone production to cause uh, more pressure on the blood vessels. Have you guys ever heard of the DTs? So the DTs are when someone, an alcoholic who's been drinking, 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 no longer stops drinking and they're involuntary nervous system goes wild and they get very high pressures, high heart rates, they can even have seizures and, and shakes and, and it's all from adrenaline and noradrenaline as well as other hormones. So people who drink more than two drinks a day, when their alcohol levels aren't rising, they're falling. And in the time of falling alcohol levels, all of us are, it, it, it jacks up our nervous systems and can raise our blood pressures. So that's why in people who have hypertension or tend to have hypertension, once they drink more than two drinks a day, they've got falling alcohol levels too much of the time, and that'll lead to high blood pressure. So it's kind of like a mini DTs in everybody <laughs> who, who withdraws from alcohol. And I don't know if any of you have ever had four or five glasses of wine and woken up at two o'clock in the morning and try and get back to sleep. He speaks from experience. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Purely hypothetical. Um, some research suggests daily intake of beet juice lowers blood pressure significantly. Have you heard of this? No, I have not. Maybe. It may be the case, but I have not heard of it. I know garlic can lower your blood pressures uh, a little bit, but it, it, it very, you know, maybe a couple of points. Certainly not as, as much as, as eating a, a, an otherwise healthy diet. And, and obviously, um, eating garlic will keep away vampires, but it will <laughs> possibly keep away other people as well. There are, there are things to know, like things like uh, black licorice cause high blood pressure. Um, there are medications that are common, like ginkgo biloba. There's a lot of uh, cough medications I mentioned. Somebody in the audience mentioned ibuprofen. Um, steroids in general, like prednisone, uh, medications like um, hormone replacement therapy, birth control pill, all of these medications can raise blood pressure. There's quite a few and there's even more and more information out there that some of the naturopathic medications can also raise medications. Uh, bitter orange, ma huang, and ginkgo biloba are examples. Wow. <laughs> So do hormones affect high blood pressure? Speaking of, you mentioned hormones. So if you're talking about estrogen, uh, in some patients their, their blood pressures are sensitive to estrogen. They go on the birth control pill, their pressure goes up. They, 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 towards the end of pregnancy, the pressure goes up. So that can happen. Now, if you're talking about other hormones, there are certainly, uh, I just want to make the point that there are a lot of hormones in your body that can raise blood pressure. If you happen to have an excess of one hormone or another of those hormones, that can also cause high blood pressure. And in some people with more extreme high blood pressures, we actually measure those hormones. And if they're coming from, say, an adrenal gland, then 
that's a rare thing, but we can actually cure high blood pressure by taking out the adrenal gland that's over secreting that hormone. And that's a very, very satisfying thing for us to find. And many of your doctors have probably already looked for it in you, looked for those hormones in you if, if you've had more extreme degrees of high blood pressure. So the Dr. Dean Ornish uh, diet, what's the current medical assessment of the program? Or is it mostly just dismissed as being too rigorous for most patients? I don't, I don't know that diet, so I can't really comment, but I can tell you the DASH diet. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's like a Mediterranean diet. Um, that diet has been shown to lower blood pressure, and that's on that website I was telling you about, hypertension.ca. The main idea is um, uh, using a lot more plant proteins like soybeans and things like that and lowering your salt. Um, those are the kinds of things in diets that have been shown to reduce blood pressure. So following the Canadian food, Canadian food Guide, going on that website, look at their dietary recommendations. I, I don't know about these other diets. And I just want to highlight that all of the slides are going to be available for you to look at again. So um, don't worry if you didn't catch any of the websites that were referred to. Um, someone was asked about taking medications and vitamins at the same time, and should all the medications be taken with water? Thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know how many of you like taking pills without water unless they're chewable, but... Uh, Maybe juice or milk. Yeah, or, uh, well, certainly the, we know grapefruit juice is something to avoid with taking medications. Some medications should be taken with food, some, sh some on an empty stomach, some it doesn't matter. And those, those uh, handouts that you get with your pills from the drugstore, th that's where you find that information. It's worth reading. There's a couple of famous drugs that need to be given on an empty stomach. And, and if you take someone that's taking them with meals and switch them to an empty stomach, their blood pressure will fall quite nicely. So just to follow and up. And combining with vitamins, um, no problem. So is there a reason to avoid citrus fruit in general when you're taking blood pressure medication? Around the time you take the medication, probably or possibly. Okay. However, uh, people on water pills, which lower potassium, citrus fruit is a nice right. source of potassium. So okay. it's only a, a couple hours during the day right. when you've just taken, just before and after you've taken the pill. Okay. How do NSAIDs affect blood pressure medications? They, um, they cause changes in the blood vessels close to the kidneys, um, and then that's, the kidneys help regulate blood pressure. So they do their damage in that mechanism, and they also can cause damage to kidneys itself, and damaged kidneys respond by raising blood pressure. So that's generally the mechanism. And I think there's sodium retention too, with, so the, somebody asked earlier about drinking water and whether that will raise your blood pressure. The key thing is it's the salt. So if you drink water and you don't take in salt, you will pee out that water. But if you take in salt and water, that, that salt will keep the water in the blood vessels. So NSAIDs and some other drugs like prednisone, et cetera, can cause what's called uh, water retention, and that's really through sodium and salt and water can cause more of this fluid retention. But just drinking water, but you're not taking in salt, you will pee that out. So a question about overdoing exercise on the elliptical or on a stationary bike, and this person is 74 years of age and they can get their heart rate to 135. Is there a possibility, can you overdo your exercise? I think I think here here you would here you would that's a very good question. I think here you would go to common sense. So if you feel good on the amount of exercise you're doing, that's great. If you're feeling unwell, that's your body's cue to tell you to cut back. So the question is I feel dizzy and faint quite often especially when lifting anything that's heavy or when I'm changing position. Is it a symptom of high or low blood pressure? So that's probably OCP more a symptom one. of low blood pressure. OCP level one. Uh, when you OCP level one. When you lift heavy weight, you strain. 
and that straining reduces the blood flow from your veins to your heart, which reduces the blood flow leaving your heart, which can lower your blood pressure. Um, so it's a sign more of low blood pressure. Now, if you are on blood pressure pills and you're, you're experiencing a lot of that, your pills might be too strong for you or they might need to be spaced differently during the day as we talked about before. And there's a, there's a couple of pills that kind of make you sleepy. So we give those pills at bedtime rather than in the, in the morning. So, you know, we kind of exploit these little pharmacological differences in the, in the drugs. These, the, their properties are all different. And we try and exploit that at times too. So this person um, knows that vitamin B supplementation causes their blood pressure to go high. And what should they do about that? Vitamin D? B. B. Vitamin injections, I think it says. So the, the big question is, you know, do they, do they have to take that vitamin? Is it necessary? Because most people, through a regular diet, get all the vitamins that they need, except maybe for vitamin D in Canada. But, um, Especially in Vancouver are... where there's no sunlight. <laughs> yeah. um, but you, again, this is Dr. Onrot's point. So if it's a temporary rise in the blood pressure, that's very different from a long-standing rise in the blood pressure. So the blood pressure rises we worry about are if the blood pressure is high generally all the time, not just a one-off when you get an injection. And then it also depends on how high is it going. So does atrial fibrillation, can it be caused by stress? If you have an underlying tendency to fibrillate, most of the time your heart is in what we call sinus rhythm, normal, regular, calm beats. And some hearts, their, their electrical mechanism is screwed up somehow, and they can fibrillate sometimes, and at other times not fibrillate. And those patients that intermittently fibrillate, stress can cause that because it's the, the adrenaline and the noradrenaline on that sensitive heart that can cause it to fibrillate. Uh, similarly, caffeine can cause some people to fibrillate. Alcohol. So um, there's, a number of, there's a number of things like stress that could cause fibrillation. Now anybody who fibrillates, we kind of like to make sure they either don't fibrillate or they're on blood thinners because the biggest danger with people who fibrillate is to have a blood clot go off their heart and cause a stroke. So fibrillation is it's one of the most common things we see now it, it, above the age of 60 and in my hypertension population. Like I, I'm lucky because I treat a lot of people with high blood pressure and knock on wood, very <laughs> few bad things happen to my patients. They don't get too many strokes or heart attacks or anything like that, but I do get a lot of fibrillation. So that's the one thing that, that people with high blood pressure are really susceptible to. So this person takes metoprolol, 25 milligrams, once in the morning and then once in the evening, and wonders about if the spacing will give him adequate or her 24-hour coverage. Well, the only way you will know what kind of coverage you're getting is if you check your blood pressure several times a day. And I don't mean every single day, but do it a few times just to see that your blood pressure just is you are getting reasonable blood pressure coverage. Another thing that you can do is this uh, machine that Dr. Onrot talked about, this 24-hour blood pressure cuff. So it'll monitor your blood pressure in a 24-hour period just to make sure that your blood pressure is adequately controlled. And that's, that's not something that we do routinely on everybody, but it is for people that, um, that you're concerned that maybe you've taken a few blood pressure readings and they go high in the daytime regularly and you're concerned that you're not having adequate control. There is some, and I, Dr. Onrod's a specialist in this, but there is some, if the, the smaller the dose of the drug, the quicker it is to run out. So if you're on a very, very small dose of metoprolol, um, it can run out before the, the 12 hours. One of the things about metoprolol beta blockers it, it, that makes them easier to use than other drugs is we can actually measure the heart rate which tells us how much beta blocker effect is going on. Whereas with the other drugs, we can measure the blood pressure and see if it's going in the right direction, but we don't really know if, if that fall in blood pressure is tied exactly to the levels of the, the, the drug. But with a beta blocker, we can see how the heart rate varies based on the levels during the day. So if you're measuring your pressure a couple of times a day and 
on the beta blocker and your heart rate is consistently in the 60s, then you know you're getting the beta blocker effect. And if your blood pressure isn't falling, then you know you need a different, you need another drug. But if your blood pressure is well controlled and your heart rate's well controlled, then you know that it's really doing its job. Great. So I'm going to close the question period for now, and uh, I'm, our uh, guest speakers are happy to speak to you for a little while longer if you'd like. If there are any feedback or um, in terms of your evaluation, or if there's other topics that you'd like to hear about, please share that with us. And I also wanted to let you know that on February 16th, we have another talk by Dr. Um, James Kennedy, and it's what the public should know about how drugs work for and against you. So meaning drugs that are over the counter and then drugs that your doctors prescribe. So I think it's a very important general talk and a lot of people don't have a really clear understanding about the medications that they're taking. So hopefully you can join us. And again, please um, disseminate information about the session to your friends and point them to the podcast. Maybe there's other topics that they missed that they would find interesting. So I'd like to give a, a round of applause to our um, speakers. And also, thank you very much for uh, giving us your evening and sharing tonight with us.